Which what thing? Okay. Okay. Cool. Hello. I'm okay. Uh, I use the post it. Um. Um. Hello. Hello. Okay. It's working. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Very hard question. Um, no, I think I'm fine. So, my care slides seem to be working. Okay. Yeah, I think it's fine. I think just finding a p just a place where I okay. guess. Yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it'll work out. And then we have the tracker. It's moving. Do you have any um, video or audio? No. No. Okay. I try and avoid any <laughs> communication <laughs> during or connections to the internet and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It should be good, thank you. Okay, so is it, it's already started screaming? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, all right. On Berkeley time. <laughs>
Good evening, everyone. Good evening, friends. Good evening, friends. Good evening to all of you, and welcome to ERG's 28th annual lecture. It's a great joy for us to be together again because for the last two years we haven't been able to meet, so this is a truly happy occasion, even beyond most annual lectures. So I'm Isha Ray, a faculty member and professor here at the Energy and Resources Group, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening. We're also live streaming this talk for those who are still in sort of Zoom mode, as it were. I have a few things to quickly go through before I introduce Dan Cameron, who will be introducing our distinguished guest. We have, we're very grateful to the Roth family for supporting the annual lecture. They are not here today, but they are live streaming, watching on the live stream. We're very grateful to them for their continued support of the annual lecture, so thank you very much, Adrian Roth and family. We're very grateful to the Rouser College of Natural Resources, of which we are now a part, as you all know, for co-sponsoring and supporting this program. We are very grateful, extremely grateful to all of you, our ERG alum and beloved students who have been the bedrock of, on which ERG has always been founded. And we're very grateful to our distinguished speaker, Mr. Meloela Ogunbi, who has a million things to do every single day, but has taken some time out to spend time with us and talk to us about her very important work on sustainable energy for all. So again, welcome to all of you. I'm delighted to see all of you. I would now like to pass over to Professor Dan Kamen for the honor of introducing our distinguished guest. Well, first I'd like to thank you all for being here. Uh, it's great to be back in person for a whole variety of reasons. Life does not exist over Zoom entirely. In fact, it's arguable, arguably how much of a good thing it is to getting as good a Zoom as we all are. But I'd like to thank you all for coming for multiple reasons. The first is we have this exceptional speaker with us, but also um, it's really a pleasure to get the chance to do the one-on-ones, the two-on-one -on -one introductions, people who have done really fundamental research on what is the role of energy in not only climate, but climate justice, water and sustainability, and I hope that part of this process of the ERG annual lecture is really one to not only get a perception of how things work if you're more on the theory side, what is the practical part if you're more on the practical side, what is the big picture guiding um, aspects of the story, and there's really no one that encapsulates all those elements more than our speaker tonight, Damla Ogun Yubi, because the mixture of projects that she's done really illustrates not only how much you can interject decarbonization and justice into the conversation, but how much you can find opportunities to bend the processes as slow as they are to make that happen. And by, by way of introduction, what I mean is that Damlola educated um, first in Nigeria and then in the United Kingdom, but at a very, very tender age, a graduate student age, Damalola um, headed the Nigerian Rural Electrification Agency and was routinely making things happen for communities that have been completely neglected, were off-grid, were really out of sight, out of mind in a whole variety of ways. And that process led her to both uh, Lagos state government and to her current position, where I believe by decades at least, she is the youngest uh, director um, at the United Nations, so she is the special advisor to the Secretary General. She runs Sustainable Energy for All, an organization which very quickly has become essentially one of the key arms of the United Nations in figuring out how do we really combine these difficult stories. And I will don't want to, we have two very distinguished economists in the front row. As a physicist, I actually claim that adding justice to the climate story makes solving climate easier, not harder, whereas I understand uh, adding a constraint should make it more difficult. But what Damalola has done is to demonstrate to people up and down the political process and pipeline what it means to turn these net zero goals and net zero goals that encompass justice, encompass gender equity, 
socioeconomic equity, tribal equity, into a conversation that has been far too long dominated by people in blue suits wa walking from one national capital to another. And this is really the moment. And just to show you how much we value this process, I want to <laughs> thank both you and your special assistant, Ugo, to come and join the ERG family. And because it's a family, each of your ERG goodie bags includes Nigerian treats, chin chin, And when you look in the bag, you'll say, why is there one lemon in the bag? And that lemon is a Meyer lemon, which is a particular Northern California speciality, as they say. And so first, both thank you guys for carving out, which is in a ridiculously complicated schedule, to come and spend time with us, but also a chance to really engage on what it means to turn these kind of lofty languages into practice. And just to show that we sort of know how to coordinate things a bit, um, as you all know, I'm now currently serving um, at USAID, and thankfully Mark Corrado, and if you could stand up for a second, Mark Corrado is here as well, the coordinator of Power Africa. And so as Damalola really instructs us as what it means to put these words into practice, we have the listening ear as well from the US government uh, planted in the room as well. So thank you so much for joining us, and we are taking notes. And we're live streaming, and so we will be turning this into a to-do item agenda for all parties. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here tonight with us. Um, so thank you all for having me. Um, I thought in case I sound really silly and I don't really say anything that you need, at least I would look nice for the occasion. Um, so I wore these ridiculous shoes and I might take them off halfway through the lecture. So if I drop, um, there's a reason for it. Um, but more importantly, um, just thank you. It's been really, really warm and refreshing being here in Berkeley. Like when I mean everyone is so nice, that's not normally what you get in New York and in other capitals. But more importantly, everybody wants to make a difference and they want to take their role seriously in making change for the world. And that is so encouraging because it brings you back, at least me, back to why I started this, right? And it was simply because I was from... I mean, in Nigerian standards, a quite privileged family, and people, we just didn't really see poverty. We had poverty all around us, but we didn't really understand what it means to helping vulnerable people. And it was something that struck to me probably when I was about nine years old, and some four-year-old child was like begging, you know, in the car, and you had to widen down, and I was trying to understand the concept of what did that mean, but family was like, oh, don't worry, 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 it's just those people. And it was something that, you know, really struck me that I wanted to dedicate most of my life to helping whoever those people are. And, you know, just because you're born in a certain family, it actually determines your trajectory in life. And that is very, very unfair, especially when you come from a developing country where you're even less fortunate. So, you know, today we're talking about driving just, inclusive, and equitable energy transition. Um, it's not an easy subject, but you need to kind of believe in it from your soul. It's not just a job. Um, so I'm going to go through, you know, what is SDG 7 and how we're doing, which you all know. But I really would like some interaction in asking the difficult questions about what we really have to do. And my favorite word of the whole year, which is disruption, because these systems have been here for decades and they obviously don't work. Because if they worked, I wouldn't be here talking to you about, <laughs> about these transitions, to be honest. So let's think about it as well. So um, I have certain objectives for the presentation. Um, talking about Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is the reason why my organization exists. And I'm the youngest undersecretary at the UN, actually, um, which is quite scary <laughs> because there's no one who's, who's my age, which also talks about these global structures we put in place and that doesn't really embrace younger people. Um, and then I'm also going to touch on, because it's about energy, so it seems... It, you know, it seems weird if I don't touch on how the Ukraine crisis is actually affecting the rest of the world and how people are almost forgetting about their climate promises when it deals with their own energy security and their countries and their economies seem to be coming first, which is understandable. 
So there are going to be four, four ways I'm going to do this, understanding the scope and current state of SDG 7, what leaving behind really means in a just transition, um, the possible implications um, of the crisis beyond Europe, and then um, the sustainable energy for all forum, which will be really exciting. So what is SE for all? So SE for all is an international organization that was born from the UN during Ban Ki-moon. And I don't know if people remember there was, before the SDGs, I think they were called MDGs or something, but there was no um, specific one on energy. So when the SDGs came out, there was now SDG 7, you know, access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Really want to focus on the word modern because we do have to think that the solutions we're providing people, are they actually really modern? Are they meant to take people throughout the trajectory of their lives or are they just a connection and a tick box without thinking about how these people evolve or develop? And then how to do that in line with the Paris Agreement was really important. You know, we're so fixated on if you're talking about sustainable or you're talking about reliable, it means you can't be in line sometimes with climate. And what I wanted to show through this role was that some of these countries are starting at such a low base that it is going to be a low carbon trajectory, but you just have to plan it properly. And more importantly, you need the data. So um, anyone who knows me, I'm obsessed with data. So we have um, data-driven decision-making. We have partnerships. With, we have a key partnership with Mark over there with Power Africa. And I'll tell you a little story about Power Africa and how it really changed my view on implementation as well. And then we have implementation on ground. And, and what that means is everything we do, if we can't point to or show the connections we're making in country, I don't believe that's success. I don't want to say it's failure, <laughs> but it's definitely not success as far as I, my point of view and the countries I represent. So what is SDG 7? I've spoken about the, the large name, but there are three components to it. There's by 2030, which is less than eight years, um, we need to ensure universal access, not just to electricity, but also clean cooking. Um, we need to have increased the share of um, the renewable mix. There's not really a set deadline on that, which, sorry, a set target on that, which was quite strange, that we have to double the rate or improve on energy efficiency. So this is where we are now. In terms of universal access, we are not on track at all. We will, all projections show that we will still have almost 760 million people without access to electricity if we continue business as usual. And bear in mind, these figures are 2019, so with COVID, that would just be worse now with the new figures that are coming out. Um, clean cooking is even worse. I think probably about, I don't know, a quarter or a third of the world population will still not have access to clean cooking by 2030. Um, share of renewables is slightly increasing depending on how you, you view modern and biomass because they're two, different, they're two different calculations, but it's still not good enough. And in terms of energy efficiency, we are projected to be off track. So things don't look very good right now, and they haven't looked good for a while. In terms of just how much is invested um, into energy, so according to our um, IEA, it's about 1.37 trillion of annual investments that's actually needed to achieve SDG 7. And I keep on saying annual, <laughs> not the total annual every single year. Um, and they break it into different um, scenarios, but the truth is there's just not enough actually happening. It might sound a lot, 1.37 trillion, but if we think you know, the minimum amount that the developed world came together to resolve the COVID crisis was 17 trillion at funding of less than 1%. And they found this money in six months. So if something is really, really important, we do figure it out as a global community. And that's how we should think about when we hear these figures. And it's probably more now, but at that time it was 17 trillion that was found. So I'm gonna get a deep dive on what is SDG 7. So according to the World Bank, this was the tier system they put together um, in terms of what electricity access really means. I personally have no time for tier zero and tier one. I don't think it's electrification. I think it's lighting. There is a place of lighting. 
it's not that I'm saying lighting is bad, but I just don't like it being called electrification. Um, I think um, I really support the work that um, Todd Moss is doing at the uh, Energy for Growth Hub in having a modern energy minimum advocated when we actually really consider what people have to use for electrification. And this modern um, energy min um, minimum is 1,000 kilowatt hours. And you, you go and see the average American uses 11,000, so you're actually only asking for 10 times less than <laughs> what most of you guys use as the minimum. So it's really important to note and put that into context. So where are the gaps? We have 759 million people without access to electricity today. And um, 592 million of those people, or a bit more now, uh, reside in Africa. Um, Asia has made significant progress, and this is really because of India, um, and everyone else will be fine, basically. What does that look like in terms of countries? What it shows us is about 23 countries in the world makes up 80% of the electrification challenge. This figure is really, really important because you can't start everywhere. But what you, want to what you want to laser focus, it's important to know who you laser focus on. So I'm not very proud to say that my country, Nigeria, <laughs> has the highest electri um, electricity access um, deficit with 19 million people out of a population of about 200 million. Um, but you know, even then, you still have countries like Nigeria, countries like Ethiopia achieving kind of between 40 to 55 percent access rates. But if you take much smaller countries, which are not on this list, like maybe, for example, Sierra Leone or Burkina Faso, that's like 9 or 10 percent of the total electrification. Some populations are only 18 million. So you know by, by getting them to universal access, it's such a huge economic growth story for those countries. So while I have this here, I don't like forgetting kind of smaller countries that you know a few million people would just transform the landscape of those countries. We really can't forget the LC, LDCs and the SIDS as we, as, as we talk about this. But this picture just shows you how bad things are and how Africa is really, really at risk of continuously being left behind because po populations are still growing. So, so it's not that access isn't happening, it's that population is outpacing connections. Does that make sense? Yeah, I hope so. So now I'm gonna move into clean cooking. And I think in, for clean cooking, it's important to understand at least the WHO definition of clean cooking. And clean cooking is the other part of universal access that we don't talk about as much. Um, so that's LPG, ethanol, biogas, solar cooking, and electricity. Um, and the, the point of this is to really, really move, especially women, I think it's 99% of women that use fuel wood into cleaner sources of energy. Um, what does that mean globally? I'm happy to say this is a statistic that Africa doesn't lead. Um, <laughs> there's about 1.5 billion people in Asia um, that don't have access to clean cooking and just shy of a, a billion in Africa. And like I said, everybody else will probably sort themselves out. In terms of countries, this is what it looks like as well. So again, Nigeria is there, and the largest one in, in Africa that um, has the largest clean cooking issue. We've got India, who's made tremendous progress on electrification, and really have made a lot of progress on clean cooking as well, if you think about the size and population of India, and then China, China is on top. But it's not just about you know how many people don't have it. It's really important to understand the access rate as well. So you have some countries like you know Madagascar that's only like one percent of their population that actually uses clean cooking. This is a big deal because clean cooking is I think the fourth largest killer of women currently in continent um, right now from indoor pollution. So it's not just a big deal from a climate lens because all the deforestation it causes, it's also a big deal because it actually kills women. So to put it in perspective, for four, William, four million women to die every year because they don't have clean access to clean cooking and that is not seen as a crisis really does bother me. And that is why I'm highlighting clean cooking in this segment. Um, so, 
So I said, yeah. And there's also 4 million um, deaths from premature things every year because of population. And then solid fuel in Africa causes more than 490 premature deaths, the second largest he health risk in Africa. So I just read that. I, I, <laughs> I didn't see that. So what does that look like? So if you had a very nice Venn diagram, and you have electrification on one side and you have clean cooking on the other side, you see the key countries that are at risk of setting everybody behind. And you have to note, we're just talking about connections to electricity. We're not even talking about sustainable energy yet. Um, so it's really, really important that when we talk and when we understand what is the energy transition, that energy access is a firm part of the energy transition. You know, it, it, it does bother me that we are speaking this language to developing countries and we're saying, I want you to do something you don't even have enough of. I, I did this um, Netflix series, I can't remember what it's called, Ugo would remember, and I tried to break it down in, in non-energy terms and I, and I said, it's like me having an auntie in Lagos and she, she gets on the bus every day and the bus takes her four hours and it's a diesel bus and she goes to her market store and she's been saving up for like 10 years to buy a little kind of diesel petrol car. And what the global north is telling the global south to do in the case of my auntie is don't buy that petrol car. Go and buy a Tesla, which is 20 times more expensive and we're not gonna give you any financing for that. And until you buy the Tesla, you have to stay on the bus. That is what is currently happening here, and that is what is so unjust about this climate movement. Africa is not the place you start from, <laughs> right? Africa is the place that you encourage to do things, but it's not where you ban the very limited resources because there's a development agenda in Africa that a lot of global North countries don't face. So our approach has always been electrification, clean cooking, and then productive uses. With everything we do in electrification, anybody who has worked on the community level of these things, you realize that these people are quite industrious. They're not lazy people sitting around <laughs> wondering what to do. They actually do have some type of small business. And what we've noticed is people increasingly tell us that we want our business to be powered before our homes because it's the business that we can earn more money, that we can grow, and then we would be able to pay for our own homes. This is really important because it cuts out that vicious aid cycle that we have, where everybody has to come and ask for aid to do anything. I'm not saying, and this is live stream, that we don't have to power residential homes. But what I'm trying to say is that for the most vulnerable people, you have, to, you have to get them out of poverty. The whole point of this is to get people out of energy poverty. It's not to give them a little bit of energy so they can live their lives, but they can't actually grow from it. So this is a point I take very seriously, and I try and do this from data. So this is um, an integrated energy plan that we did for Nigeria. It was very important for me to think, okay, um, we have all these people in Nigeria that don't have electrification. What is the least cost way of connecting these people? Because money matters as well. Is it grid connected? Is it mini grids? Is it solar home systems? And that is what we've, we've kind of plotted here. And then what is the cost of it? There's also some really cool stuff about availability costs, you know, the cost people will actually pay for electrification, the cost people will pay for sustainable energy. That's all there. Um, but it's just a, it's a good way to see. But more importantly, it's a good way to attract the private sector. So the private sector can see from community to community where power is needed, where the ne nearest bank is, where financial inclusion can be, and it allows them to determine they want to go to these areas before they even step into the country. And so I feel like data is such a powerful tool that we do not utilize enough when we're developing energy systems. Because it was truly integrated, I really, really focused on clean cooking as well, because I hadn't seen anything. I hadn't seen anything to, to tell me what is the best source of energy. Can people, do people need subsidy for LPG um, canisters? Can people do e-cooking tomorrow if you connect them? And that's what we also have here. We split between rural and urban because it's really important. A lot of people feel, I think it was Bemi that mentioned today, that when we're talking about electrification, we just mean rural. No, we don't. 
70% of Africa is going to live in the cities in a few decades. So the cities really matter. And some of the cities don't have electrification. That's just the truth to span the whole community. So you really have to take that in consideration. So I'm just, this is just to show you examples of models. And then we have it. And the, the last bit was to make it publicly available. There's so many things sitting on people's desktops. There's probably lots of research stuff that you guys have done. The more people know about these things, the more attractive they are, because we really, really feel that governments should stick to policy and enabling environment, and private sector needs to be the one driving the energy sector, at least on the continent. So, I mean, you all know this. So I'm not going to talk too much about it. But this is what we tend to present to a lot of politicians as well, especially the ones that don't really care about climate. You know, you have to talk about the job creation thing. That's always number one. Um, and for decentralized systems, every thousand connections will bring you 25 jobs. This is an important statistic. The growth in agriculture, value chains. And then the one that really shocked me um, was the one um, in terms of women. So at least in sub-Saharan Africa, if you give a woman sustainable energy and nothing else, this is no microloans or pensions sorry, or anything like that, they are likely to earn 59% what they were earning before just by having sustainable electricity, which will finally put them on par with their male counterpart, which is quite exciting. Um, I spoke for like 30 minutes and I realized I have so many slides, so I'm going to quickly go through, <laughs> go through all of this. Um, um, energy, um, share of renewables, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I think a lot of people understand where we stand with the share of renewables in terms of the country profiles. Um, only about 16% of energy consumed by the 20 top energy consuming countries are actually from renewables. Um, so it's really important. It's really important to note that. Um, some are doing better than others, as you can see. Um, in terms of global investments in renewables, I feel it's kind of stayed quite static. It's, you know, it goes from like 290 billion to like 300 billion. It goes down, it goes up again, but there's not been this um, huge surge that we really wanted to see to the one trillion mark, which is what we've always been promised and always been, been guiding. Um, China is still the top investor in renewables, and then the next kind of two-thirds of investments are done by the EU, um, the UK, and the US. Um, and that's a lot of countries, um, but it's still not at the rate we would like to see, but it's still so much better than energy access and also efficiency. Um, this is about wind and solar, but I'll come back to that if I'm asked questions. <laughs> Um, instead, or um, in terms of um, energy efficiency, um, I'm sure you all know there's a calculation that roughly about um, 4.8 um, megajoules to generate one dollar of economic activity, and it differs um, per by continent. But this is this is based on um, the World Bank SMAP data. And if we want to go a bit more granular, um, you can see the countries that that actually affects. Um, energy efficiency is so important now. I think with everything going on, I think we, we need to really take that a lot more seriously. And I, I'm going to speak maybe out of hand, but that's what shocked me when I was in New York. I got to New York and all the lights are on all the time. And I'm looking around like, okay, this is really, really weird um, that you're not, you know, just conscious that there's no, you know, everywhere you go, everything is on and it's not necessarily energy saving. Um, but obviously the efficiency in so many other areas as a transportation sector, that just, it's just the, the level of waste, I guess, when you have a lot of it, you know, we really need to put some key policies in place. And that's what I'm going to really say about that, because I think you know, we do have an understanding um, of energy efficiency. I think globally, let's be honest, 2014, we had over 300 billion. 2021, we have less than 300 billion. It shows that no one's really taking it that seriously because it shouldn't be going up and down, up and down. I mean, it shouldn't be static. Again, a lot of more money because there's a lot of money that can be saved if you do, if you are energy efficient. Um, Europe and Asia leading the efforts in energy efficiency um, by far almost double of what North America is doing right now. So I guess that's important for you <laughs> in this room on how you can actually change that dynamic, especially for the continent. OK, 
like I said, all of that, and I just got to the second section, so please bear with me. Um, this, this slide is very, very important to me. I don't think people understand when we talk about just how inequitable energy consumption actually is. So myself, being born black African, is 20 times the disadvantage of anybody in the world because of how much energy I'm born into. So being born in Africa, you're already born into energy poverty because there's just not enough energy. So this was kind of just showing just how much energy per capita consumption that is actually utilized and how privileged <laughs> people, especially in North America, really are. Um, and then do they need that? So when people, again, it's like, it, is it Africa that you start with? This is another slide I think is very, very, very important. You know, if you if you look at SSA and you take out South Africa, the installed capacity, this isn't the amount of, this isn't the amount of energy produced every day, but the installed capacity is eighty one gigawatts. <laughs> I mean I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> you know, so it was like all oh, the big grids. I'm like, which big grid? You know, this is eighty one gigawatts. And to bring it really home. This is, these are the emissions. That little blue part, <laughs> okay, where is it? <laughs> is for one billion people. So again, when everyone talks about climate and the emissions, I'm like, this is not, um, this is not where you start. This is what you prevent from looking like this. So what do we have to do? If we want to take just, inclusive, equitable energy transitions seriously, then we need to prioritize Africa, and we need to prioritize energy access and make sure it's done in a low-carbon pathway. This is very, very important um, because the energy transition story um, for the African and probably parts of the South Asian continent is about small-scale diesel and petrol generating that you can't control. You don't know where they are half the time and they cause so much damage. That is the transition story. It's not necessarily big coal plants or, or the way people like to put it. The other thing is, um, um, is developing proper energy transition plans for the African context. So one of the reasons why we chose Nigeria was because it was such a big oil and gas economy and it was the largest economy in Africa. And we looked at it and we first tried to develop a plan for you know, the great net zero and Africa and Nigeria achieving net zero by 2050. We saw that was impossible. That just was not going to happen. And then we then focused on it being by 2060. And I think the next slide just shows you know, what is required. So for a country like Nigeria, that's just one country in Africa, it's going to need about one, point, sorry, this still says 2050, but it's going to need about $1.9 trillion. This is if all the policies are perfect and political situations are perfect, that is how much is needed, of which 400 billion is above business as usual spending. So it's really um, important to understand that these transitions you want these countries to do also have to be funded and they have to be funded by someone and it's not just about decommissioning coal not everybody has coal decommissioning coal has to happen and it's very very important but countries that don't are not dependent on coal also have to be taken seriously because they can use all sorts of other devices to get to their transition and we can't come back and say oh why did you do this it was like well you never supported us with the renewables that you say that you're supporting. I don't think the figures are, are here, but I think the African um, energy sector got about four billion last year of investments, which is nothing, you know, in renewables, <laughs> you know. So it's not like there's this big push to give all this money to renewables and clean as well. And that is a narrative we really want to change. Um, so I've spoken about that. I'm just going to really just quickly touch on the energy markets um, and the effect of the Russian-Ukraine crisis. I think we all agree that this is a very awful situation and this isn't something we could have predicted. At the UN, there are um, three crisis groups. There's one for food, there's one for energy, and there's also one for finance. And I lead on the one for energy. And we just had to you know, look at you know, the stat statistics in terms of like, 
you know, um, Russia's, you know, share of the market in terms of energy, the people and the countries that are at risk because of um, the, um, the Russian crisis, but I don't think it's up there. But what struck me was that we're actually at risk of about 24 countries going into famine as well because of the gas prices affecting the fertilizer companies and the fertilizer companies not producing fertilizer to produce food to serve people. So it is a really really tough situation right now. In terms of um, energy security issues affecting kind of like our global energy mix, what we've seen is quite tough. So um, people kind of delaying the exit from coal is quite shocking and people being able to switch back onto coal that they claimed were de decommissioned is even more shocking and when you see countries like you know, even Germany sometimes, you know, like if German efficiency can't fix it, I don't know what can. Um, <laughs> that is, <laughs> you know, that is tough. And it's again back to the argument that if the richest countries in the world can't figure it out, how do you expect the poorest countries to magically leapfrog? Um, opposition to nuclear, c completely diminishing, um, diminishing at this time. I don't really think that's particularly a bad thing because I think we need all these different aspects, but we need to be consistent with our messaging. Um, hoping that there's a big acceleration of renewable deployment, that's a good thing, green hydrogen. Um, but then we also see that going in, you know, after this summer goes, going into the winter months, everybody else is going to need for power for heating, which means increased gas and increased other productions. We've also seen, which is, which is somehow worrying, how Europe is increasingly asking gas producing and oil producing African countries for more when they've made it very clear that they're not funding any type of fossil in some of these in some of these countries so again it's the consistency of messaging um you know you can't say a fuel is good for me but it's bad for you it has to be it has to be consistent we are all trying to get to a point of renewable energy that is our goal but what transitionary fuels might we have to use to do that i don't think any country should dictate what the other country needs um maybe apart from coal i think we should all know that we have to get out of that in terms of um, livelihoods, obviously there's the cross-border um, disruption and all the horrible things, you know, especially with the refugees. I spoke about fertilizers. I spoke about supply and chain disruptions. Um, and these are the things that we're trying to um, get to at the UN. Um, I don't know if people know, but if there's any shake or any crisis, what happens is a lot of the, especially European countries, shut down their borders to everything and try and keep it internally. That greatly affects everywhere, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and it's an instant thing, and people are not held accountable for that because understandably they're protecting their own economies, but that's that's not really good enough. In terms of food, I think the hardest hit has been um, the issues with wheat, barley, um, sunflower, not sunflower, sun seed oil, there's just like three or four main ingredients to make everything else. And, and some countries are really, really suffering by not getting that because Ukraine is really the food basket of the world. Um, but more importantly, people holding what they have, very similar to vaccines, and not, <laughs> not wanting to share it. And this is something at the UN that we see is, is not right, and we're speaking up about it. Um, and then I guess the large part is, is finance, you know, because everyone's like, oh, this is great. People can't fly pay for fuel subsidy. Yes, that is good, but it doesn't mean that some of this fuel subsidy won't happen with social protections. There are countries that have to pay off debts that are going to default on those debts, which means they can't borrow any more money. And there are also countries that, frankly, if we are um, going to be um, honest with ourselves, they are not going to be able to afford these fuel prices. So if you can't afford this people that totally changed the shape of you know what global GDP is going to look like. I don't think we can really say what that could actually look like. And unfortunately, it's always the most vulnerable countries that suffer. And, uh, and these are the activities that the World Bank and the IMF are taking very seriously, but these are things that have to happen quickly. And I guess finally, finally on this issue, it's going to be the reduction of aid because understandably countries are gonna push their aids to Ukraine, which is needed, but that means cutting out whole programs 
especially in the SIDS and the LDCs, which sometimes make like 90% of their aid budget and like 40% of their actual budget. So it is, it is a real tough time. On the bright note, <laughs> we're having a forum. <laughs> so everything, <laughs> see how I switched over there? I have to end on something light. Um, uh, so we normally have this every two years at Sustainable Energy for All. We couldn't because of COVID. This time we're having it in Kingali. I'm super excited to bring everyone on the continent because I think everyone should just see how amazing the continent is. And everything I spoke about is going to be highlighted. Mark and Dan are going to be there, <laughs> which is most exciting. And we, we hope you guys will as well. But it's all focused on kind of just how do we actually accelerate sustainable development goal seven. Um, and then also building on the momentum of last year, which is when we had a UN high level dialogue, which was the first time in 40 years the UN had had a conversation about energy. Bearing in mind we have a COP every single year, it just shows the, the disconnect. And we also see this as a really critical moment between COP26 and what we're branding as an African COP in Egypt. Um, I'm not going to go through all these objectives, but I'm going to talk about the youth. So registration fees waived, thanks to Ugo sitting over here. Um, and we really, really want to get youth voices. This is the continent of the youth. The youth are doing so many amazing things. So we don't want to be like all these conferences that um, the youth are just kind of the fifth panel member, <laughs> you know, when you kind of list everyone out and then realize you don't have a youth. We actually want the youth to truly participate. So anything you guys want to do, please, please tell us. Um, and diversity is very important for me as an organization, and especially female voices in this space as well, because I know just how hard it is to be a female in the energy space and been taken seriously as well. So these are all things we're going to try and capture here. Um, and I hope you guys can join. So I think I'm at 50 minutes, but I will stop here. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you so very, let me take this off. Thank you very much, Damilola. That talk was truly in the spirit of Erg's mission of a sustainable environment and a just society. And we're really, really grateful that you shared your views with us. So Damilola requested a very interactive session because she's very interested in hearing the questions that our students and our alum have. And she also said she was very open to challenging questions. So we don't have to do any polite, like vanilla stuff. <laughs> Bring on the rocky road is what we say. <laughs> so um, I am going to moderate. So I'm going to try my best to give everybody a chance to ask a question and keep track of who's raised their hands. Um, there are some mics that will meet you if you plan to speak. Please do ask any questions that you want to ask. This is a great opportunity. And I'm going to just try to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask a question if they want to. A and just, just um, it, it's good if it's mainly a question and not a very prolonged comment. <laughs> <laughs> we have one speaker, and she's done speaking. OK. <laughs> Thank you so much for, uh, for the amazing talk. Uh, you had alluded to this a little bit in your remarks. I'm Max Alfhammer, a faculty here. You stepped up in such a big way, uh, and, and your career is amazing. So can you talk a little bit about what was really hard on your path to this stage and beyond? Hello. Hello. OK. All right, great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Max. I think, um, especially in the younger days, when I was young, um, it was the fact that I was young and female. I think there was, especially in my country, moving on to the federal government. Um, I'm from Lagos, so everything 
in, it's in the South, everyone's cool, but when I moved to the federal government, I realized how backwards people were about women in any type of leadership role. And they just didn't think there was any place for leadership, or sorry, for women. And I had quite a few occasions that people would just say that to my face, and I would just be like, what? You know, that you, you shouldn't be here. You know, it's engineering or it's energy. It should be male-dominated. And I told Max yesterday that, you know, in some areas they, they put man, child, goat, and then put woman at the end of the scenario because that is how, that's how little, unfortunately, they think about us in, in, in some of these societies. And, and that's why it was very, very important for me um, to, to break what is conventional in those societies. Having said that, I don't believe it's, it's, it, it's better in um, the global environment, but it's not, it's not great. I mean, there are not that many women you can point to in the in the energy space, even even here. But there's so many women doing amazing things, right? But there are not that many women that are recognized, which again, I think is quite sad. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Demi Lala, for your presentation. I know I just walked in, but I've been listening on YouTube this entire time. I swear. <laughs> Um, my name is Bukala, I'm a grad student here, and I'm also a consultant on an energy research project. So you actually showed a lot of data. I took so many screenshots of your slides. I hope that they share the slides after because the data was actually really amazing. So I'm wondering when you discuss the financing gap, especially for the continent of Africa and how it'll take, I don't know if, if you said it was for Nigeria in particular, for all of Africa, it'll take almost $2 trillion to finance you know, um, access to energy for all. And I'm wondering, because the project that I'm on is trying to fill that financing gap with remittances. So I'm wondering if you think that that's a viable strategy or if there are other financing methods that you can say, that you can highly recommend in that um, context. Okay, so that 1.9 trillion was for the energy transition. It wasn't just for universal access. And it looked up at five sectors. It was um, building, oil and gas, transportation, um, electrification, industrialization. Because I, 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 I feel, and um, in the plans it shows, that when you are talking about the energy transition on the continent, you have to put universal access first. Then you have to think about industrialization, how much power that would take. And then you also make sure it's in a low carbon way. It's not the other way around. Um, that 1.9 trillion was just Nigeria. It wasn't the entire continent. And I, yes, I do think the financial model that you're looking at or the instrument is viable. But I, I, I don't think that, um, I, I think there's probably about six or seven instruments that should be working at the same time. And I definitely think there's space to develop more in innovative financing to resolve the issue. So I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Um, you know, it's only in some parts of West Africa, which Nigeria is part of it, that we've seen actually um, financially viable mini grids, right? And it's not because they're selling power, it's because of all the different services they're selling with the power. So you have a lot of tech people in the power space because they want to sell micro pensions and loans and all those things. And power is just a fraction of what they actually earn back. But when you have that um, financial inclusion um, channel, it allows you to do so much more. And that is, um, that's an area that I think is gonna grow a bit more. You won't see traditional energy people or even traditional solar providers uh, have at the main sources of at least decentralized energy. I think you'll still see them for grid base. And for me, that's really exciting because when we were doing these projects, we never thought that that's where it would get to. We were just doing it because we wanted to provide SMEs with better power sources and make sure they took away their generating sets. We didn't know that there was this whole channel of investments that could come. Um, I think they even some of them pay their school children's school fees through the same portal that they pay for their solar supply. So it's quite cool. Thank you. Um, I work in the um, private sector, mostly on energy storage, and I'm curious to know your um, stance on the um, link between education in those areas where the investments are taking place. Um, specifically, for example, when new technologies come into place, it takes certain effort for uh, wh whoever is installing them to you know, get them running for a specific period of time, if you talk microgrids and other sorts of uh, energy technologies. 
how does, um, when we talk about education, we talk about also the role of um, bringing some part of the population in line with that type of technology that it was not necessarily developed in the local areas. So I wanted to hear about your experience with that type scenario in which like, if we want to empower and bring some sort of like sustainable justice to these areas, what has been sort of like the main challenge on like engaging population with this type of technological sort of like catch up that has to happen in these areas? Okay, I mean, I don't know the technology you're talking about, but the only way you can show people that they should use anything by, is by doing the projects. And I feel sometimes when people are developing new technologies, they're thinking the policy should drive the projects. The truth is no policy will be in place until people see things working. And, um, and luckily, a lot of people in these communities, when they see things working, they're your biggest advocate for continuing it, right? So if you give somebody sustainable energy, they want to keep on having sustainable energy, especially if it's affordable. So um, there is work at the beginning to even tell people that solar works because some people don't believe it and it's not really their fault. It's all these solutions that had been provided that didn't work in their communities. So I don't, you know, when people say, oh, it's a new technology and stuff, I, you know, we had the discussion today. I don't think it's about technology. It's about people understanding what works and what doesn't work. You have to understand some of these communities have not have electricity for ever. <laughs> you know, they, and they've been promised by governments or people coming for decades that we're coming back, we're coming back, we're coming back. You can imagine if that was you or your family. So if you have that mindset, it's easier to say, and, and we always do this, like if we go into a normal community, um, especially in my previous year, we would do the chief health, the, the school and the primary health care center. And we just have that run for six months. Everybody else will be begging to, to be connect to whatever that is. You know, but if you if you do it and you want to have this big community relation thing, which is good and you have to do anyway, but you can't show what is coming to place. And the first thing you show them is this is the tariff model for people who have never you know who've never used electricity and their clean cooking is free through fuel wood. It's not going to work, right? It's just human behavior. It's not about being in Africa or Asia anyway. It just doesn't work that way. So it's it's kind of showing by example um, to embrace. I think I think something like storage people have embraced it right I, I really don't know any any decentralized you know project that doesn't have solar plus storage what they might not have is they might still have an increased use of using a di diesel generator because the storage might not be enough because the storage costs have not gone down to a price point right where you know turning on the gen set for 10 days a year just makes sense but that is back to the economics i don't think that is really the technology issue um, and then the price drop is really important because we spoke about the supply chain issue. By the time it gets on continent, it's not as cheap. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not as cheap as how everybody talks about it. And that's why there needs to be, um, I'm not saying compete with manufacturing, but there needs to be assembly capability on continent. I don't know of anywhere now, maybe South Africa, but I still doubt that you can buy 5,000 panels if you just wanted it now on continent anywhere. And that's very scary if you're saying that this is the way that the whole continent should be going. Uh, thanks for a very fascinating talk. I think one number that struck me was that, you know, Africa has a 80 gigawatt demand. That's is like power demand for Texas. <laughs> one fortieth the population. I think I have kind of two questions. First is that, do you have examples at a national scale in Africa? There was some rapid progress either in clean cooking or electrification. And what was kind of the few factors, or it doesn't have to be national. A large program that became successful, what was kind of the secret sauce that made it happen, and is it replicable? And then I had a hard question slash suggestion is that I, I, I find this like, why are we calling it clean cooking? It should be convenient cooking. Like if, if the climate footprint is so small, why are we focusing calling it clean? Any form of convenient cooking will bring justice and it's the footprint is so small that maybe that's the way to make it more politically attractive. But the first question is more important. 
I'll answer the second f question first, because if you don't have clean, green, or sustainable, nobody really wants to fund anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just like the energy transition. When you call it energy access, no one is really interested. But when you call it energy transition, then yes, we're ready to fund. It's, it's a sad world we live in, but terminology does matter. But back to your other questions, there's just quite a lot of factors that go into things being successful. And no, it doesn't have to be on the federal level. But having federal might normally counts because a lot of counterparts, especially when they're not from the locality, want to see what does the federal government say. You know, you can't run a World Bank program unless the federal government signs off, even if it's on the state level. And they're the ones that are going to bring, bring funding. So I would say that there's, there's, there's a, the first thing is political will. You know, governments, local gov local governments, they have to have the political will that they want to do this. The second thing is the use of data and technology. It's, uh, you know, has totally changed the landscape. Being able to understand people's needs now and what their needs will be like in 20 years' time and planning for that whole energy exercise is, is, is does make a difference on the type of investor you get because you don't invest in this sector if you want to be in and out in three years' time. It's not a valuation game. It's a long-term game. It's almost like thinking of yourself as a utility. So having the right type of investors, which I don't think usually come into Africa, a lot of people come in for the subsidy, and when things are not going very well, they go out again. And, and that's why you have to train locals. You have to train locals to take, to take things up and have a right balance of international companies and local companies um, um, doing the work. And then finally, financing, right? Um, I ran the largest energy access program in Africa, and it's still the largest energy access. And uh, it's just ridiculous. We should have a 1,000 of these by now. You know, it's the only one affected by the World Bank, and it's in one country. It's just, you know, like there needs to, I'm sorry, the fourth one is international coordination and seeing something as a crisis really being a crisis. You know, there's no, there's no sanctions on the World Bank or the AFD or the a AFDB or any of these development agencies to get things done within a certain time, you know. There's no conditions. If it takes two years or if it takes six years to make a project effective, nothing happens to anybody. It's not like if you're working in private sector and you don't hit those KPIs, you might get sacked. Nothing happens. <laughs> and then when the project is actually effective, that's when the nightmare actually starts. Because every dollar you send has to be signed off by DC or Abidjan, or one of these places that are not around. If it takes them three months to answer your email, if it takes them two weeks, again, nothing happens. And it's always the vulnerable people that suffer when everything is delayed. So, um, yeah. So we also have to hold organizations accountable because those are the only organizations and instruments we have. And that's why I'm really pushing for private sector to come in and hopefully that's what Mark and Dan are also going to make sure they bring into the continent very soon. Hi, I'm a graduate student here too. I, I had a question about the slide about the 61, I think it was 61 gigawatts. 81. 81. What do you see as, in rough numbers, the deficit to where it should, you know, what is the, the level of energy that electricity that that should be represented there and 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 how do you what do you see as sort of the energy pathway the mix of sources that are that could get to the target um, that's both economically and environmentally sustainable and I guess yeah. I have a third last part <laughs> is just what I mean to get there what are the main obstacles I mean you, is governments is it you know function corruption functioning governments uh, economic, you know, um, institutions. Um, so, I guess a three-part question there. Okay, so um, um, the 81 gigawatts has to at least be 20x to get anywhere near anyone living a decent life. Um, it it does happen, you know, like my country has 40 gigawatts, but it's diesel and petrol generators. 
It's not in store capacity. So it's not, this, this is the kind of true sense in terms of what is on grid and what is big and what is recognized. The truth is the economies are much bigger than that. It's just that they're working on much dirtier fuels, which we're trying to avoid at all costs. So I have to, I have, to have a caveat when it comes to that. Um, I can't remember your second question. I can only remember your third. Um, in terms of what has to happen, I think it starts and ends with financing. However useless and maybe even corrupt some governments are, <laughs> right? If they know that if something is going to be funded, it is not in their interest to stop that. But right now, there's nothing encouraging, right? There's, you know, like you... Like we said, we need 1.9 trillion for Nigeria, and someone goes, "Oh yeah, we've got, you know, 500,000 to assist you on this." Like you're not gonna, no one's going to like say, "Oh yes, let's take that 500,000." So the economies of scale is really important. Scalability is important. Where we we want to provide sustainable energy for a billion people, not ten, not two, not a thousand. So I, I think. Uh, and once you understand that and get that scale right, and there's financing to back it over a number of years, by the way, it's not just one year or two years, people will fall in line. And, and I can only speak from my experience, right? Because everyone thought I was crazy, powering schools and hospitals, you're not going to get anywhere from that. But once I said, oh, here's 550 million from the World Bank and the AFDB, all the regulations were signed off, all, in all the policy work was done because this was real money that could connect real people. So I'm, I'm not just saying this, I've lived this. Um, and your last question, sorry. <laughs> Um, yes, they definitely have to. And I can't tell you the split between hydro, solar, wind. But I can tell you, um, which seems very controversial, that gas is part of the African energy transition, for sure. Even if it's just there for base load to integrate the renewables. But it is there. Um, what we need to be doing is stop having a conversation about fossil or no fossil. We need to have a conversation about how to fund the whole energy transition of which there, was a, there would be a time that gas increases at least to 2030 while you're trying to get to universal access or 2035, and then it will decrease again mm -hmm. later on. But to think that that is not going to happen is, is, is not right. And, and, and I feel gas is part of most countries' energy transition, especially when it relates to um, clean cooking or convenient cooking, as it is called now. Uh, thank you for the really interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions about uh, the financing uh, part. Um, the first one is: Can you um, what what in your what in your mind is the primary obstacle to, for more private sector investment? Um, and then I have a question about more like subsidy type um, uh, investment. Well, how in your mind how should that be structured? So is that sort of lots of small grants, or w in what way do you think would that ideally be distributed? Okay, so I'll start with the subsidy. Um, for me, um, the, I'm a big fan of resource-based financing. So I'm a big fan of subsidy post-connection. Um, actually, subsidy three months after connection. I have to see it's been working for three months. And, and um, so it's not you just take the subsidy and run away with it. Um, again, when you're dealing with this type of challenge, it has to be to scale. So you, you don't only want companies that can do one or two mini grids, you want companies that can do 100 mini grids and affect a few hundred thousand people, right? And, and I do think that those subsidies should be per connection, but it should be to scale if you really want to, if you really want to change things. Again, please, it doesn't mean that a lot of these pilot, um, um, pilot projects that are actually you know, showing different technologies that are different new technologies aren't important. They are important, right? But like I tell people, all the to, to, to get universal access, we have all the technology we need today. <laughs> right? So let's, let's stop saying we need to create this. We don't in terms of technology. It's just good to have it. And I used the example this morning, like when I did my project in Lagos, I was using gel batteries. I can't even imagine doing anything without lithium now. Right, but it doesn't mean I regret using gel <laughs> initially, and they're not still working. Right, you know, but it it just 
factors, again, just during the evolution of technology, I think is important. Um, in terms of, um, you mentioned um, the private sector. I think we need to get out of this notion that the private sector is going to come and save us. Government plays a role. Sovereigns play a role to help sovereigns. And private sector are only going to come in when there is the right enabling environment. And that's beyond regulation, right? That's security. That's understanding your foreign exchange regime. That's I have to be able to get my money out when I put it into your country. If I put things down, I need to take them out if, if things go wrong. And those are the environments we really, really have to create if we're serious for the private sector to come in and still provide them subsidy <laughs> to, to, to get it done. So I just, I, I hate people thinking, oh, the private sector, these, they, they're there to make money and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I mean, we might have to cap how much they want to make, um, but they, we need to create environments just like everywhere else that if you were going to set up a business, that's just a minimum of what you'd want to do, what you want to see, and that's where the data played a very big piece and, and the role and in getting investable type documents, you know, vestable decks. Who do you talk to when you step into a country? Which government party, which permits do you need? All those things determine the types of private sector and, and what they're going to do. And I think that's missing. And we've, we've been spending a lot of time working with countries on that and showing them that they're actually in competition, which some countries forget sometimes. <laughs> Hello, thank you so much for your talk and refreshing perspective. I'm part of the so-called private sector <laughs> and part of Enline, which is a data and sensing company that's focused on energy reliability. And I guess I think data can play a lot of roles in this. It can shine a light on inequity or it can actually you know, trigger actionable change and insight. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what are your sense of the key data gaps and what are the ones that are actually going to lead to change and action um, and policy change? Well, I'll give you some background on it. Many years ago, again, when I was younger, um, Power Africa actually funded about 25 um, really exceptional Nigerians to come and work with me on this issue. We wanted to save the world. We're going to provide everybody access. And it was a really great time because that's when we really delve into the data. And we probably spent about 2 to $3 million on investable grade data where I can tell you community to community what they need, what are their productive uses, how much do they pay for energy, um, would, they, would they even use solar, you know? And, and we went down to the ground level, and that was invaluable. If we hadn't spent that two or three million dollars, we wouldn't have got the money from the World Bank. Because it put us to a path where we were saying, well, if, you, if, if, if we get 500 million, this is exactly where we're gonna put it. And it just changes things when you're able. Obviously, there are a whole host of other things that you have to do. But it just changes the perspective when people know that you have the correct data and, and you can back it up. And then from the data, you can then show your regulator that this is why you have to sign off on this mini grid regulation, because I now have the data. And this is why you have to be able to tell people that what happens when the grid comes, you know, and you, and you really plot that in there and show this is where the grid is. The grid might come in six years. Do you still want to build this? If you don't, you want to interconnect it with the disco. So it's, it's, that data is really, really critical. Another data point that I feel we don't collect enough is what people do once they have energy, um, energy right? So before and after, we tend not to, con and, and, and I spend a lot of time on there. So with the SMEs, I wanted to know if they've employed somebody else. What were they earning before? What are they earning now? Um, um, did they rent another shop? Which is another way to know that things are going well. So that, that there's a whole host of things, but those data sets are also important because when you're going for more money, you can show the economic growth story. And, you know, and that should be what we're trying to get at. We shouldn't look at vulnerable and poor people as poor people we're trying to help. These are people we're literally trying to get out of energy poverty so they can stand on their own two feet. Um, so any data around there is really, is really my, my thing, really, to explain to people that these people, they're not there because they want to be poor. You know, and you're not necessarily helping them. You're kind of doing what you should be doing by making sure at least they have um, the basic rights, which should be energy and water. Yeah. 
Thanks so much. Uh, you've mentioned the political will to do some of these things, and I'm so to me, uh, I think to many people, we see that as a huge barrier. How do you see the trajectory of a political will uh, going forward? I mean, we see certainly the COVID uh, got all the a lot of political will for money. How do you see um, energy transitions of the sort that you talked about? faring in the uh, arena of who gets the attention, who, who gets the money, and what, what can help your arena get more of the attention it needs? I think for energy access to be seen as sexy as climate would be the first thing on my list, because it's not. You know, and for some reasons, people don't even put the connection <laughs> that energy is so important to climate. So I, I think if it, if it was, and I think that's why the term energy transition seems to be working a lot better. And there's, there's political will on two levels, I guess you mean. First, from the developing countries, or at least like the G7, to recognize that it's beyond coal. That coal is really important, and I work on coal decommissioning, by the way, but there are countries that don't even have anything. So how do you even get them to that point? So you don't have to come back in 20 other years to transition that. You know, you actually have it's the best opportunity right now if you don't have enough of something, you know, and, and in terms of like a financial opportunity, Africa is one of the few continents that's gonna need more power. So all these things you're building with panels and inverters and batteries, it's only there that would probably need it when everybody else has transitioned. So I think selling it as an opportunity. And then on the local level, which is um, in the developed co developing countries, explaining to them that energy is critical for anything to work, even politically. I think their frustration is probably like my frustration when I was in that level where you, are just, you just keep on waiting for the donors. And there's a four-year cycle. I don't care who it is. If you had an agency, you feel that pressure. You could have come in as a technocrat, but you feel that pressure. You know, you're already in like year three and you can't show anything on ground because all you've been doing is paperwork. And, and, and I guess the elephant in the room and nobody tells you that when you are dealing with these large loans, no one gives you a checklist. So you get something done and they come back and say, you haven't done this and then you do it, and then they come back and say you haven't done that. At some point they told us to pass a law, and that's when I was like, look, you could have told me two years ago, it takes about two and a half years to pass a law in my country. You can't do this halfway through the time, and then, you know, and, and that's another thing I'm trying to push with a lot of the DFIs. Let the country know, let them decide, but don't take them on this pathway where you just keep on changing the goalpost, and then when things fail, you say, oh, it's a country. It's no, it's not always a country. It's, it's the fact that you keep on changing things. Um, the country has its own issues, by the way. I'm not trying to say countries are perfect, but it's the, the whole global architecture of giving um, concessionary loans or grants to developing countries has to have a fundamental shift for this to, for this to work. Thank you so much for the great presentation. My name is Matthews. Uh, I am from Malawi. I was born and raised in the village without electricity or running water. So this subject is very, you know, touching to the core. Uh, I'm a student here. Uh, I, I'm a graduate student here in the master's degree in uh, development engineering. I have two questions. Uh, the first question uh, revolves around the empowering women, especially rural women. Uh, I, just based on my experience, um, most of the technology that comes to, the, to Africa or to the villages end up in the hands of men. And most of the time it's not used to uh, uplift the household. It's uh, used to uplift an individual. In your approach to uh, electrify Africa, have you put any effort in trying to work with women in cooperatives uh, so that the uh, electrification does not come uh, leaving women behind. That is my first question. My second question revolves around the Ukraine-Russia uh, war. There's a lot of panic in the world that food prices are going to go up, food prices are going to go up. 
And most of the time, the reason we're giving is because of fertilizer that comes from oil. And we know that is not even sustainable. I wonder if we, there's any discussion uh, in the uh, United Nations to encourage some of the alternative methods of growing food, such as organic way of growing food, particularly in Africa, where the prices of fertilizer is just very, very unbearable. And the, just going through fertilizer is not going to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start with the second question. For about four years now, there's been a big push of just rethinking how agriculture works um, because there's Ukraine just showed us the key man, key country risk involved, but there ha there is a big push. But f and I'm I'm not a food person, so please bear with me. But my FAO colleagues are saying that but that takes like a ten year transformation that is happening. So it's not just the easy as in okay, um, Ukraine can't supply wheat. This is the person that's going to start producing it. Um, it is a process, and it's something they are looking at. However, like you said, you are right. It's not that there's not enough food. It's that people are also hoarding food and things where they are, and it's not being distributed. That is what we're finding now. But why this time is actually more scary is just how close to famine we are in a lot of these countries. That, yes, they can't afford fertilizer, but they can't afford oil. They can't afford a lot of these different things. And that is a very, very scary notion. And that's what we're working on, the relationship between energy, food, and finance. So we're not doing what we always do and take things in silos. And food people just do with food. And energy people just do with energy. And finance people just... Because you can't do that in this case. You all have to work together. And I think... Um, in a few weeks, we would be able to share with you some data, some heat maps, and some some things that we are actually telling um, the global and international organizations, but also the G20, G7, that they have to do, and some policy decisions that they have to do now. In terms of women, um, just like data, I don't think anyone who knows me will know I'm obsessed with women, but it's not just about empowering women in the rural communities, which I'll talk about in a minute. It's making sure women are in the input for good. So women have to be the ones doing these projects. Sustainable and decentralized energy or clean energy is one of the few things that you can get a 50-50 split. So in my career, it's more about just training a lot of STEM students to actually work. So I train for employment. I don't train for training. <laughs> you know, I, I go and ask, especially in my previous role, all the mini grid guys and stuff, who do you need, when do you need it by, and if I train them, will you employ them? It's, it's, it sounds very crude, but it really is that simple. Also in the program I ran in Nigeria, I, I insisted that if you can't show me at least 40% of women in your workforce that was an admin, then you would not get access to the subsidy. And you'd be surprised how many people can find women once you do that, all of a sudden, they can find women to employ. But these are the things, I just want to stress, that these are the things that people don't have, feel they don't have power to do. Um, um, but they do. You know, just, just say it and let someone tell you why you're doing it. And let them get in trouble. Um, in terms of the rural communities, I think you're right. But I, I do believe, at least in West Africa, it's shifting. Um, like I said in my previous role, I probably tested, there was one time I tested 25 sewing machines because it, tailoring was what people were doing, though I knew there were a million female tailors and certain things. We are focusing more on productive use with a really, really big push with microfinancing for, for female SMEs as well in rural communities. Um, so there's a lot going on. Is it enough? No. And, and that's why I'm, you know, like I say, that I'm totally against this tier zero, tier one, because then it's light, and then it does affect the individual. But by tier four, it affects the entire family. And, and, and what you tend to see is that women operate just outside their homes when they also have sustainable energy, especially even the agriculture. They're doing drying, they're doing something. They're definitely using their homes as their shops. So that is happening increasingly as well. And for some reason, that's also making the men comfortable because they're still in the same certain realm. But the biggest thing we can do for women, the biggest thing, especially on continent, is to provide clean cooking. You're going to save four and a half hours of the woman's day 
but more importantly, what is really scary is the reduction in gender-based violence. There's, you know, there's so many threats just going from the home to get the fuel wood. One in seven women get raped. There's some really horrible stats, but even at home, there's a risk of being beaten by your own spouse if food is not ready on time. And these are things that we just take for granted, and it's these women that are actually suffering. So that's why clean cooking is so, so important. Um, I actually just wanted to ask, I was curious um, about your opinion on how African countries can leverage power within convening parties such as the United Nations and what in your role you've seen as the shortfalls of convening parties such as the United Nations in providing an equitable environment for that um, exchange to happen. Um, and at the beginning, you also said that you would share a funny story um, about Pa Africa that changed your view. And if you still want to share it, I want to hear it, but maybe it's fine. Anyways, <laughs> thank you. Um, first, I don't think every country should be relating with the UN if you didn't have to. Like, I ran the biggest program in Africa. I never spoke to anyone at the UN. You know, so you know, so I, w I want to bring that. I want to bring that forward. But I do believe the UN has the responsibility um, to to make sure global action is needed on on situations where 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 we say it's, it's critical, where we say it's crisis. I think the UN has the responsibility to make sure that when people are talking about climate, they're understanding what energy needs. They are as well. I I think it's important for the UN to keep saying that. While we're doing all this stuff, it's great, but we can't leave a billion people behind. Um, and then I guess the most important statistic is if, if we don't achieve this by 2030, which is not looking likely, we can't achieve our climate goals. And again, I don't think people put that together when they're talking, and I think that is our responsibility um, to do that um, and to, to be pro-poor, to think about the poorest countries um, at the same time. And, and with Power Africa, I think I might have dropped the hint, but I was just saying, I was just gonna talk about, um, you know, what it took to, to get Power Africa to, to fund, I don't know if it was that funny, to, to fund all these, um, all these Nigerians to, to come back home. It's not often that you have an organization ready to almost break protocol because you know their budgets in place and their line items and the things that they they set out in DC and they have to implement on ground but understand that this is just so important and we can make so much impact and it can go so wrong but they're willing to stick their out so their necks out so again I'm not I, I feel development and aid can work right but but they have to be listening to the countries instead of deriving something thousands of miles away from the country and then getting upset when it's not <laughs> implemented in the country, <laughs> like really getting upset and then calling everybody, they're not doing this and like, but you didn't even speak to the country. Um, so we're doing an integrated energy plan in Malawi right now on clean cooking and stuff and Malawian government was like, we, I don't want one electrification, I want one clean cooking, so we'll do clean cooking. <laughs> like, it's not a big deal. <laughs> we, we came in with a plan, but that's what they want, so that's what most likely they'll be able to set up policy and implement. That's what you do. Um, and yeah, so that's how I've lived my life. <laughs> Understand <laughs> Understanding people's needs and trying to make sure that we do it in the most effective manner. Well, that's a wonderful way to end. We want to thank our speaker again for this wonderful talk. We can't thank you enough for joining us today, Danilola. And thank you for being an engaging and wonderful audience. Um, I'm really happy that annual lecture is back in person, and I hope to see many of you again next year. Thank you.